among the very unusual pictures uh, that are in Hild Hildegard of Bingham's Givius is this one, which goes by, of course, all these, uh, all these images go by a variety of titles, just people trying to say what they are. Um, so you would probably find different things. Um, this one I label, labeled the egg of the universe uh, because of the quotation here. By this supreme instrument in the figure of an egg, and which is the universe, invisible and eternal things are manifested. So what you have is a kind of oval or egg shape uh, that represents the universe. And of course, eggs uh, generate, you know, that's where uh, uh, baby chickens and uh, other animals come from. Uh, even humans uh, come eventually from uh, in the, uh, eggs within the uterus. Uh, so, you know, the egg is a kind of um, symbol or instrument of generation. And so she's used this to symbolize the universe. Um, in her vision, she says that there's fire burning on the outside, uh, God burning everywhere. Uh, I think that probably is the idea of light and uh, warmth and just, you know, God is, uh, God is everywhere. Uh, and so what they're using for the image are the sort of jagged uh, forms uh, that come out from the, the, the edge. And we talked about the jagged forms that you would see uh, in connection with migraines and also the idea of dots and stars, which we see the stars here. But that also relates to the ideas um, of what the universe was. Um, well, let's go on with hers and, and then I'll talk to you about what, how this relates to how the universe was perceived during the Middle Ages. Um, so she has the, the fiery ring, which we see here, uh, and then red stars at the top, which represents the planets and the sun. And uh, you can see uh, the image of the uh, crescent moon uh, within the blue field with all the stars. Uh, the bright red uh, uh, star uh, represents the sun, uh, and the other ones, uh, the planets. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. In the center is the globe of the universe. And she said there's a mountain that separates light and dark. And this is all very stylized, of course. You might say a kind of diagram of the universe. Um, and it seems, um, I could say, a very dynamic universe. You know, it's going to come into being and, and pulsates and burns with being. Okay, I wanted to relate this to what medieval ideas were about the universe. Uh, the universe was believed to be a sphere. Now, I know that some of you heard uh, that story that is prevalent among American school children, uh, that in the, uh, 1492, Columbus was so brave because everybody thought the world was flat. Well, that's nonsense. I don't know. Maybe there were some peasants that thought the world was flat. Uh, but generally, every educated person uh, from uh, classical antiquity, from the time of, at least from the time of Ptolemy, uh, believed that the universe, including the Earth, was a sphere. And they thought that the sphere of the Earth, the globe of the Earth, was at the center of the universe. And that the other planets, the uh, wanderers, as the name means, um, were in, sort of embedded in crystalline spheres that rotated around the universe. Now, what are those planets? Those planets are, if you're standing on the Earth, what appears to go around the Earth. So this would be the moon, the sun, and the planets that you can see with the naked eye. Uh, so basically, everything up through Saturn. Um, many of the planets beyond there weren't even discovered until the 20th century. So, pretty good telescopes. Some, some maybe in the 19th century, but uh, they weren't discovered until modern times. <laughs> um, and so, these are the planets. And then beyond the planets, there is another sphere. The outer realm is the realm of the fixed stars. The stars don't appear to move. Uh, so, they believe that there was a globe with these uh, stars embedded in them. And then, in Christian idea, 
out beyond the fixed stars was the Ethereum, and for Christians, that's, that's heaven. That's where God dwells. Uh, also, if you remember your Dante, uh, Christians uh, placed hell in the center of the globe, uh, you know, sort of as far away from God, who's out there beyond the fixed stars, so right in, in the center of the universe. Now, she's not showing us a hell scene here. Um, what she's showing is uh, the dynamism of creation, essentially. And one of the points that she makes is that all of God's creation obeys him. Uh, the things that are portrayed here, the sun, the moon, the stars, uh, the rain, the wind, all of uh, the, the objects that we might say are in the natural universe obey God. They rotate the way God wants them to. The rain falls when God wants it to. But you, oh humans, uh, Hildegard says, uh, as though you know, God is speaking, uh, but you, oh humans, you fail to fulfill my commandments. Oh humans, God is just. He had the just arrangement of all the things made in heaven and earth. Now these are little excerpts. Uh, obviously, it goes on, and, and uh, uh, there's a lot more to the uh, text. One of the really original scenes, about the many original scenes in here, we've already seen this when I was talking about the migraines and wanted to show you the black stars, uh, but this is the uh, image for Lucifer's fall. It doesn't show devils. It shows golden stars falling and burnt into blackness. And the largest gold star, which uh, falls to the earth, as you can see, is large. Uh, that is Lucifer. Lucifer, of course, means light. Um, and on this page, there's gold and silver is used. And silver is kind of interesting because silver can oxidize. But um, they, seem, they think that silver was used because this is part of the colors of her vision. Um, and so uh, they're sparkling. So there's this feeling of light and dynamism, and as Lucifer and the fallen angels, who are here represented um, emblematically as stars, uh, fall to the earth, they become black, like ash and d dirt. And the composition is absolutely unique. Um, it's, it's something you don't see anywhere else. It's just totally original. As is her representation uh, from her vision of Adam's fall. Now when I say her representation, I don't mean that Hildegard made the paint strokes necessarily, uh, but uh, following, following uh, Cavanus's uh, ideas that Hildegard was essentially the designer and oversaw uh, the images. Uh, we can in a sense say that they are her images I and mean, it's her vision um, and uh, her leadership in uh, uh, designing and, and telling uh, how this should be portrayed. Her iconography for Adam's fall is totally unconventional. Adam literally appears to be falling. So you have this, once again, a feeling of dynamism as though um, there's a suggestion of movement in the pictures. And the tree of knowledge, which is this, this black shape, uh, the serpent is actually seems to be growing out of the tree of knowledge uh, as though uh, he's a branch. And he curves over, and uh, the tree curves over, and that repeats the curve of Adam's body as he falls away. Uh, it also uh, repeats that very interesting kind of shell motif that's, that's coming out of Adam's body, which we're going to talk about. And as you can see, there's a sort of... Um, U-shape with, with flames coming out, and I'm assuming uh, that uh, Adam is going toward the fiery pit of hell, that this is uh, the idea that now uh, the fall of Adam has brought death and sin, uh, sin and death into the world. Um, you have some wonderful fanciful little trees for the Garden of Eden below, and uh, our vivid golden stars uh, light up the sky. Now that uh, shape that has been called a, a shell-like shape because that's what she uh, talks about. It has stars on it. Um, this is from her vision and Eve is represented symbolically. You remember Eve came out from Adam's rib and so here we have this uh, shape that uh, is, is attached to Adam. 
Uh, the composition has these, you know, really beautiful shapes and colors. It's it's beautifully organized. Um, it's not trying to imitate nature. Don't expect it to do that. This is a vision. Uh, it's re trying to represent something that she believes is spiritual. And it's shown with simplified, symbolic forms, um, which are really unique in the history of art. Um, I can't think of anything else uh, like this um, as far as the iconography and the way uh, it's represented on the page. Uh, this is also a very symbolic image. Uh, there's the, this it looks like none of the images of the Trinity. Uh, we see the Trinity um, sometimes as uh, two men and a dove. Uh, there's even some examples where it's um, sort of a three-headed being, uh, sort of personified Trinity. Um, but in this case, it's you know purely abstract abstract shapes that she explains. Um, Hildegard sees the Holy Trinity as a cutting sword that penetrates all things. And she says that these three silver lines, down going down the middle, are the edges of the sharpest sword that can cut through sin. So the Holy, uh, you know, the, the Trinity, uh, the Christian idea that God is three beings in one uh, person, um, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Here is simply represented by uh, three silver lines. And there's also references here to the blood of Christ uh, between these, um, these lines. You see uh, red shapes, and this is the blood of Christ, which would be contained within the Holy Trinity in a sense. Um, the visions are immaterial. They are uh, in this case, totally non-figural. This is also very interesting. Well, in images of the creation, we sometimes do have these uh, circular scenes, but the arrangement is just uh, very, very different. Um, and the shapes on this page I find uh, fascinating. They're not all symmetrical. Uh, there's uh, wonderful feelings of positive and negative shapes, negative shapes being the background shapes. Okay, this is from Scivius. It's the six days of creation. And you can see right in the center there are two uh, columns with uh, three circles, and each one represents a different day of creation. Um, up above, there are these concentric circles, uh, which she describes as the living fire of the Creator God. Uh, circles, of course, represent eternity. Uh, they are something that has no beginning and no end, is in a sense a, a kind of perfect shape. And as we said, it's the shape uh, that was believed to be uh, the universe. Uh, right at, well, coming from those concentric circles at the top, you have uh, this kind of shaft of silver, which she describes as the finger of God, <laughs> uh, sort of pointing down at the earth at the very bottom. I don't know if you can make this out on the image, but the very bottom. Uh, there's little wavy lines that represent uh, red clay, and a human face seems to be uh, taking on form as though it's emerging from it. So it's God is creating man down at that point. Um, and then, of course, we see man again as Adam up in the upper left uh, corner. Um, he is smelling a white flower that in her vision is offered by God. And she says, he took in the smell with his nose, but he did not perceive the taste with his mouth. And she goes on and uh, talks about him not experiencing this um, flower fully. Um, there's a little pun in Latin. Uh, sapere means taste. Sapientia means wisdom. So because he did not taste or fully experience, uh, he lacks wisdom. Uh, he's not fully experiencing uh, the great gifts that God gives to mankind. Um, we see all of these stars. She says the stars represent you know, the just of the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the prophets, and John the Baptist as a living flame. Down below you have a very unusual <laughs> image uh, of a figure, which is supposed to be Christ coming from Mary's womb. And once again, the, the, these are from her visions and very unconventional iconography. Um, 
we do see images something like this. We see uh, images uh, of uh, uh, small figures being held in the bosom of Abraham. Uh, but in this case, it's not uh, the bosom of Abraham or God. Uh, it is a personification of holy wisdom. Uh, in her, in her um, vision, she describes the celestial Zion and the daughters of Zion. Uh, one of the things about visions is that you have sort of multiple meanings. <laughs> and so what happens is they, they talk in a very visionary uh, uh, fantasy, and then when we try to interpret, you know, we're trying to uh, make something uh, a little more uh, tangible, you know, say hard and solid, which is not necessarily what the vision is. Uh, so this is identified with Holy Wisdom, who is also identified with the Mother Church. And there are, um, there have been some references to the fact that she often has female personifications. Uh, Sapientia and Ecclesia, uh, Wisdom and Church, are feminine nouns, of course. In this case, she is holding uh, the virgins, the martyrs, and there seem to be other people um, in her arms, so the, the church is enclosing the faithful. And it's been suggested that they uh, might also be uh, specifically referring to uh, Hildegard's uh, nuns, uh, although there, I think there are some male figures, figures that seem to be male, uh, in the arms of the mother church here.